Fear is the path to the dark side. Good afternoon. It is my great privilege and pleasure to welcome you to Northwestern Law School on this very special occasion. We are pleased this afternoon to host the Honorable Eric H. Holder, Jr., Attorney General of the United States, who will deliver an important policy address regarding national security, the Obama administration's counterterrorism efforts, and some of the specific ways that today's Justice Department is working to protect the American people from terrorism and other urgent threats. This is my kind of crowd. I haven't said a word and I already got a standing ovation. <laughs> I, I probably ought to leave right now. Uh, thank you, Dean Rodriguez, for your kind words and also for the outstanding leadership that you provide, not only for this academic campus, but also for our nation's legal community. It is a privilege to be with you today and to be among the distinguished faculty, members, staff, alumni, and students who make Northwestern such an extraordinary place. For more than 150 years, this law school has served as a training ground for future leaders, as a forum for critical, thoughtful debate, and as a meeting place to consider issues of national concern and global consequence. This afternoon, I am honored to be a part of this tradition, and I'm also grateful for the opportunity to join with you in discussing a defining issue of our time, a most critical responsibility that we share. How we will stay true to America's founding and enduring promises of security, justice, and liberty. Since this country's earliest days, the American people have risen to this challenge and all that it demands. But as we have seen, and as President John F. Kennedy may have described best, and I quote, in the long history of the world, only a few generations have been granted the role of defending freedom in its hour of maximum danger. Now, half a century has passed since those words were spoken, but our nation today confronts grave national security threats that demand our constant attention and our steadfast commitment. It, it is clear once again that we have reached an hour of danger. We are a nation at war, and in this war we face a nimble and determined enemy that cannot be underestimated. Like President Obama and my fellow members of his national security team, I begin each day with a briefing on the latest and most urgent threats made against us in the past 24 hours. And like scores of attorneys and agents at the Justice Department, I go to sleep each night thinking of how best to keep our people safe. I know that more than a, a decade after the September 11th attacks, and, and despite our recent national security successes, including the operation that brought to justice Osama bin Laden last year, there are people currently plotting to murder Americans who reside in distant countries as well as within our own borders. Disrupting and preventing these plots and using every available and appropriate tool to keep the American people safe has been and will remain this administration's top priority. But just as surely as we are a nation at war, we are also a nation of laws and of values. Even when under attack, our actions must always be grounded on the bedrock of the Constitution and must always be consistent with statutes, court precedent, the rule of law, and our founding ideals. Not only is this the right thing to do, history has shown that it is also the most effective approach that we can take in combating those who seek to do us harm. Now, this is just not my view. My judgment is shared by senior national security officials across the government. As the president reminded us in 2009 at the National Archives where our founding documents are housed, and I quote again, we uphold our most cherished values not only because doing so is right, but because it strengthens our country and keeps us safe. Time and again, our values, our values have been our best national security asset." End quote. Our history proves this. We do not have to choose between security and liberty, and we will not. Today I want to tell you about the collaboration across the government that defines and distinguishes this administration's national security efforts. I also want to discuss some of the legal principles that guide and strengthen this work. 
as well as the special role of the Department of Justice in protecting the American people and upholding the Constitution. Now, before 9-11, today's level of interagency cooperation was not commonplace. In many ways, government lacked the infrastructure as well as the imperative to share national security information quickly and effectively. Domestic law enforcement and foreign intelligence operated in largely independent spheres. But those who attacked us on September the 11th chose military and civilian targets. They crossed borders and jurisdictional lines, and it immediately became clear that no single agency could address these threats because no single agency has all of the necessary tools. To counter this enemy aggressively and intelligently, the government had to draw on all of its resources and to radically update its operations. As a result, today, government agencies are better postured to work together to address a, a range of emerging national security threats. Now the lawyers, agents, and analysts at the Department of Justice work closely with our colleagues across the national security community to detect and to disrupt terrorist plots, to prosecute suspected terrorists, and to identify and implement the legal tools necessary to keep the American people safe. Unfortunately, the fact and the extent of this cooperation are often, often overlooked in the public debate, but it's something that this administration and the previous one, and the previous one can be proud of. As part of this coordinated effort, the Justice Department plays a key role in conducting oversight to ensure that the intelligence community's activities remain in compliance with the law, and together with the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court in authorizing surveillance to investigate suspected terrorists. We must and we will continue to use intelligence gathering capabilities that Congress has provided to collect information that can save and protect American lives. At the same time, these tools must be subject to appropriate checks and balances, including oversight by Congress and the courts, as well as within the executive branch, to protect the privacy and the civil rights of innocent individuals. This administration is committed to making sure that our surveillance programs appropriately reflect all of these interests. Now, let me give you an example. Under Section 702 of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, the Attorney General and the Director of National Intelligence may authorize annually, with the approval of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court, collection directed at identified categories of foreign intelligence targets without the need for a court order for each individual subject. This ensures that the government has the flexibility and the agility that it needs to identify and to respond to terrorists and other foreign threats to our security. But the government may not use this authority intentionally to target a U.S. person here or abroad or anyone, anyone known to be in the United States. The law requires special procedures reviewed and approved by the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court to make sure that these restrictions are followed and to protect the privacy of any U.S. persons whose non-public information may be incidentally acquired through this program. The Department of Justice and the Office of the Director of National Intelligence conduct really extensive oversight reviews of Section 702 activities at least once every 60 days, and we report to Congress on implementation and compliance twice a year. This law therefore establishes a, a really comprehensive regime of oversight by all three branches of government. Reauthorizing this authority before it expires at the end of this year is the top legislative priority of our nation's intelligence community. But surveillance is only the first of many complex issues that we must navigate. Once a suspected terrorist is captured, a decision must be made as to how to proceed with that individual in order to identify the disposition that best serves the interests of the American people and the security of this nation. Now, much has been made of the distinction between our federal civilian courts and revised military commissions. The reality is that both incorporate fundamental due process and other protections that are essential to the effective administration of justice, and we should not deprive ourselves of any tool in our fight against al-Qaeda. Our criminal justice system is renowned not only for its fair process, it is respected for its results. We are not the first administration to rely on federal courts to prosecute terrorists nor will we be the last. 
Although far too many choose to ignore this fact, the previous administration consistently relied on criminal prosecutions in federal court to bring terrorists to justice. John Walker Lynn, attempted shoe bomber Richard Reed, and 9-11 conspirator Zacharias Massawi were among the hundreds, hundreds of defendants convicted of terrorism-related defenses without political controversy, without political controversy during the last administration. Over the past three years, we have built a remarkable record of success in terror prosecutions. For example, in October, we secured a conviction against Umar Farouk Abdul Muttalib for his role in the attempted bombing of an airplane traveling from Amsterdam to Detroit on Christmas Day 2009. He was sentenced just last month to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Now, while in custody, he provided significant intelligence during debriefing sessions with the FBI. He described in detail how he became inspired to carry out an act of jihad and how he traveled to Yemen and made contact with Anwar al-Awlaki, a U.S. citizen and a leader of al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. Abdul Muttalib also detailed the training that he received, as well as Alaki's specific instructions to wait until the airplane was over the United States before detonating his bomb. In addition to Abdul Muttalib, Faisal Shahzad, the attempted Times Square bomber, Ahmed Galani, a conspirator in the 1998 U.S. Embassy bombings in Kenya and Tanzania, and three individuals who plotted an attack against John F. Kennedy Airport in 2007 have also recently begun serving life sentences. And convictions have been obtained in the cases of several homegrown extremists as well. For example, last year, United States citizen and North Carolina resident Daniel Boyd pleaded guilty to conspiracy to provide material support to terrorists and conspiracy to murder, kidnap, maim, and injure persons abroad. And U.S. citizen and Illinois resident Michael Fenton pleaded guilty to attempted use of a weapon of mass destruction in connection with his efforts to detonate a truck bomb outside a federal courthouse. I could go on, which is why the calls that I've heard to ban the use of civilian courts in prosecutions of terrorism-related activity are so baffling, and ultimately they are so dangerous. These calls ignore reality, and if heeded, they would significantly weaken. In fact, they would cripple our ability to incapacitate and to punish those who attempt to do us harm. Simply put, since 9-11, hundreds of individuals have been convicted of terrorism or terrorism-related offenses in Article III courts and are now serving long sentences in federal prison. Not one has ever escaped custody. No judicial district has suffered any kind of retaliatory attack. These are facts. They are not opinions. There are not two sides to this story. Those who claim that our federal courts are incapable of handling terrorism cases are not registering a dissenting opinion. They are simply wrong. But federal courts are not our only option. Military commissions are also appropriate in proper circumstances, and we can use them as well as to convict terrorists and disrupt their plots. This administration's approach has been to ensure that the military commission system is as effective as possible, in part by strengthening the procedural protections on which the commissions are based. With the President's leadership and the bipartisan backing of Congress, the Military Commissions Act of 2009 was enacted into law. And since then, meaningful improvements have been implemented. It's important to note that the reformed commissions draw from the same fundamental protections of a fair trial that underlie our civilian courts. They provide a presumption of innocence and require proof of guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. They afford the accused the right to counsel, as well as the right to present evidence and cross-examine witnesses. They prohibit the use of statements obtained through torture a cruel, inhuman, or degrading treatment. And they secure the right to appeal to Article III judges all the way to the United States Supreme Court. Fear leads to anger. Anger leads to hate. Hate leads to suffering.